I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken, so to speak. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and I have a very special show this week, and I have two very special guests. First, we have uh, Mr. Boyer Co., Mr. Universe, Mr. World, Mr. America, and uh, we also have Richard Baldwin, who was a two-time Mr. America winner in the middleweight class. We're here today to talk to you about one of the real greats in the sport, a real legend who just passed away recently, Bill Pearl, and both Boyer and Richard uh, knew Bill very well. They moved him for many, many, many years. So I thought it was uh, we should have a special show for Bill. I met Bill, of course, a couple times as well. But uh, you guys really knew him very well. So uh, thank you for coming on the show, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you, John. Okay. Well, Boyer, why don't we start with you? Uh, I know you knew Bill a long time. Um, did you know Bill when you were starting bodybuilding as a teenager and read about him in the magazines? Actually, I started following Bill Pearl when I was 12 years old. Wow. <laughs> At the time, the only magazine that was available on a newsstand that had anything to do with bodybuilding was Strength and Health. Mm -hmm. And then most of it was strictly Olympic lifting. But they did provide a little coverage about bodybuilding, grudgingly, because Bob Hoffman was 100% AAU and weightlifting he didn't even like bodybuilding yeah but what i recall was seeing a small picture of bill pearl and this is going back to about 1958 or so hmm. right before and, and and i saw his physique and said my god this is what i really would like to look like and and, and he he was he had given an exhibition at uh in philadelphia john fritzy's gym it was a a double bicep pulls on Oh, man, I said, this is what I like. And, and then I, I didn't have an opportunity to meet him until a few years later. Actually, it was in, I think it was in uh, Winter Haven, Florida. Okay. I, I was competing in a contest, and Bill was going to give a posing exhibition. And that was my opportunity to see him in person. So I flew to Tampa, and uh, lo and behold, he was, he was with uh, – Dr. Craig Whitehead. So many, it was sad. So many of these guys have passed on. Mm. So anyway, I, I got a chance to meet with him, talk to him, and then went down. Uh, Frank Zane gave me a ride. We went down to Winter Haven, Florida. And, and Jim Hazel won the contest, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that wasn't even my goal. I just wanted to see Bill Pearl in person. So that's that was my first seeing him pull and it was incredible mm. he gave it like the old man type strong man posing routine like with the he had the fake mustache and yeah like you just and, know, yeah yeah and, and the fur trunks and all like that yeah and then he came out again and he posed he was fantastic and and then what i realized a little bit later on he had been friends with red laurel who's been my mentor my whole life so mm. that even brought me closer to him so th that's how I really became friends. And then after he had his bad last accident, I talked to him and his wife probably almost daily, checking on to see how he was doing. Wow! Really? I, I really wish I really wish you would have had time to get Red on here because Red was probably the last guy to visit Bill before he passed away. He went to see him probably oh not more than two weeks before he passed away. Really mm -hmm. sad. Mm, wow. Richard, how about you? When was the first time you met Bill? Gosh, I, it was actually it, that I met him was 71. Okay. It was like yeah, he'd been a hero of mine for a while. And I even took photos of him uh, to the gym to inspire me. But when I found out he was going to guest pose in uh, Homo, Louisiana at a contest and Boyer was too. And then I... Um, the, the guy actually asked me to judge. The promoter asked me to judge. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll come. Yeah, that's another reason to get there. So, but it was like, I've never been the same. You know, I mean, 
he was perfect head to toe. His tan was like nothing I'd ever seen. I guess that Native American uh, heritage helped him there. But I mean, it was perfect. Trunks perfect. Posing perfect. I mean, he, he would complain. He complained before about his head was too big. But I said, Bill, it, it fits your body. You'd look like a pinhead if you had a smaller because you're so huge. I yeah. said, it, it, you look great. But that yeah. was the first time First time I, I, I met him. Yeah. And it's I posted a picture of shaking his hand. And uh, it's you, the look on my face is crazy. It's like, you know, like you met Jesus or something. I got this big smile. Like, <laughs> oh, my life's going to be great forever or something. I don't know. But, yeah. you know, it was it was. I think it impacted me as much as the first time I met John Grimmick when I was a lot younger. Mm -hmm. Wow. But uh, it, what the funny thing is, later we were talking about getting together, and he said he still had that same shirt, and he'd wear it when, when we got together for dinner. <laughs> Never made it because of COVID, and then the accident. But and yeah. we, we, I'll, if you want, I'll read a few things he said since then. Sure. In that period. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, one thing one thing I'd like to add with all of the tremendous awards and every accomplishments of Bill, the one thing that stands out the most, he was truly a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Forget about the bodybuilding. He was just a very, very nice guy. He, he was he always had time to tell you hello, regarding or matter how busy it was, it was at a trade show and mm -hmm. a contest. And he and he was unbelievable. And remembering people's names. Yeah. You can meet yeah. him the first time, not see him seven, eight years, he'd still remember your name. Yeah. That's he like John Grimmick. Time. I mean, I yeah. met Grimmick when I was a kid in college. And years later, when I was on the cover of magazines, he said, Hey, are you that kid that you remember me for that? I'm like, Holy <laughs> mackerel. Yeah. He had a hell of a memory, too. But you're right, Boyer. He is one of the nicest guys I've met. And Boyer's another one. Boyer's another guy that is such a great representative for the sport. A yeah. gentleman. Uh, I've never heard anything bad about Boyer. He's a great guy. And Bill was another one. I mean, uh, one of the nicest guys I ever met. And not, no big ego. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that kind of shocks you when somebody's, you know, up there that far and yeah. the ego's just not there. Especially, especially in the bodybuilding world, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's very <laughs> unusual, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Boyer, because, you know, when Bill passed away a couple of weeks ago, all I saw on Facebook was, like you said, it wasn't about his contest. It wasn't about his physique, although that was incredible. And he was a real legend in his time. But it was more about just the person he was and what a great guy he was. And he was like that with everybody. And that's just so unusual to have, you know, such a great human being in this in this sport of ours, you know, where it's, it's all centered around the body and, you know, about it's kind of a narcissistic sport. But Bill was such a genuine person. He was such a good person. I mean, I think we all, all of us that met him, we all try to strive to be like him, right? You know, I mean, he was such such a great example for all of us. Well, it, it's true. It, and like I said, he was such a humble guy. Yeah. That's that's really what made it stand out. Such a, such all the accomplishments he had, but he still maintained a very humble attitude towards everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the first time I met him, I was like 25 years old. It was at that club industry show they used to have in Chicago, and he was with Life Fitness. And uh, I I was just walking. I used to go to that expo every year because they used to have bodybuilders there at some of the booths. And um, I was walking around. I saw him at the Life Fitness, and I was like, wow, I wonder if I should go over there and, and talk to Bill Pearl. There's Bill Pearl. So I gradually went up to the booth, you know, kind of slowly, and he seen me coming, and he comes up to me. And he made a compliment about my physique and he shook my hand. I was just blown away. You can't beat that, huh, John? <laughs> no, I mean, unbelievable. It's just incredible. What a, what a, yeah. Such a great guy. So you mentioned, uh, Richard, that guest posing. Now, that was the year that Bill won the 1971 Mr. Universe. That was his yes. last Mr. Universe. Yeah. And I, I got all these old issues of Iron Man I've been collecting recently. And I read about that. They had the story about Bill. And they, they mentioned that, Boyer, that you and him guest posed at a contest, I guess, uh, Leo Stern was kind of setting this up and he had him guest pose like six months before the, uh, before the universe. And I guess Bill was a little bit smooth because it was still six months away and he wanted to see what the uh, reaction of the crowd would be like, Oh, per Pearl's too smooth. He's not going to do it. And then I think when the contest got closer, they set up another guest posing with you and Bill. And was that in Louisiana? You said, yeah, it was in home of Louisiana. Richard is right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, the guy that promoted that was a guy by the name of Arlie Vest. Yeah, great and guy. He got, so, 
And he got so excited. He was a huge fan of Bill Pearl. So I never will forget this. After the contest was over with, he had a big party at his house. So in the mix of all that stuff, neither he nor his wife forgets about the kids. <laughs> they left them at the contest. Oh. So everybody's, everybody's back at his oh. house. And all of a sudden, so, well, where's my son? <laughs> Didn't you pick him up? No. They were still sitting outside. We went oh, back man. to the, the, where the, the, I can't remember where it was at a high school, maybe. The yeah. kids were just sitting outside on the steps. <laughs> they forgot their kids. They were so excited about yeah. Bill being there. And I thought I was excited about Pearl being there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Richard, I'm glad you mentioned also his posing. If you guys could like talk a little bit about his posing. I mean, Bill wasn't like, a, like an Ed Corny type of poser, right? But it was just when he got up there. I heard this from so many people who've seen him pose that he just really commanded the stage with his presence. Yes, yes, I, I, I definitely think that. And it was like you couldn't find a flaw on him, I don't think, because he he could hide any flaws he had, I think, pretty good. Yeah. And it was like Zane hides his flaws, you know. But it, he was so huge and just, I don't know, the way he moved, it was like a, it was like watching an, a, a, some art or something, or I don't know how to describe it. What would you say, Boyer? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with Leo Stern. Mm -hmm. Leo Stern spent a lot of time with Bill. Yeah. And Leo was a was a pretty, pretty accomplished photographer. And they took thousands of photos and would study just how the right angles were this pose or that pose. Mm -hmm. And, and and, and Leo's old gym, which is still in San Diego, still in existence. No kidding. He had a wow. skylight. Of, and, and, which, and I was fortunate enough to be photographed there once by uh, Cliff Swan. Cliff which Swan. Was, this was right after I won uh, the Mr. America. That was some of the best photographs I ever took. But wow. it was just perfect lighting. And, and I think Leo really, really spent a lot of time perfecting Bill's posing routine. I think yeah. that's what helped him out a whole lot. Yeah. But he, he was an accomplished poser because each pose to me represented power, powerful physique. And that's, that's what he projected. Hmm. Okay. And perfect symmetry. And it's and the way he moved from one pose to another. I mean, a lot of guys have a pose that most of their body looks pretty good, except one leg might be twisted a certain way that mm -hmm. kind of throws off the symmetry. Order. But Pearl Stern worked with him so hard. It, you can't couldn't find a flaw in any of his poses, don't you think, Boyer? Oh, I agree. I yeah. agree. He 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 was he was flawless because yeah. they worked for perfection, you know. Which you mentioned something earlier today. I don't even follow bodybuilding anymore because I think it's just lost its way. It has it has no appeal to me whatsoever. You mentioned the board shorts, and, and I when I first saw, I said this can't really be happening. I think what's happened, it's just turned into a money-making machine yeah. for the promoters. If they could add another six categories, they'd go ahead and do that too. All they're worried about is collecting the uh, the entry fees. And, and everybody wants to get up on stage and get awarded something. And I think that's what's happened. And, Don't and get as me far started. As, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and as far as opposing other bodybuilders, and, and I guess I should because I'm old, I'm out of shape. I'm not, you know, I'm far removed. But the posing, all they do is look like they waddle on stage and, and hit a couple of poses, and that's it. There's no grace to it anymore at all. Mm -hmm. The fact that they have to go like this to get applause, I, I hate that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, me too. I never could understand. If you if you got to do like that, yeah. Yeah. You, you, if you're good, <laughs> you, the audience will let you know it. You don't need to do that. Yeah, I want you guys to expand on that a little bit because, uh, you know, I hear people like in, in our generation or, you know, before my generation, we criticize the way bodybuilding is today. But I mean, bodybuilders always did try to get bigger, right? I mean, Bill was a big guy, but it wasn't always about just size. I mean, when you guys were younger and you were trying, to, well, I know, Richard, you had more of a, a type of Frank Zane type of physique. But when you guys were younger and you were pursuing bodybuilding and you were working your way up, I'm sure you wanted to get bigger, too. But the emphasis was more than just size, right? It was a beauty. You yes, know. and it wasn't ignoring the waist. 
Yes. You had to have a small waist. Mm-hmm. Even Arnold, you look at Arnold's waist and you go like, nobody his size has a waist like that anymore. Right, right. You know? The Boyer's generation, I mean, they were get, starting to get huge, but Boyer and Air had a big waist. And th- right. those guys just, that was a that was a key to being a bodybuilder, was yeah. huge with a small waist. Well, you, you, always, you always had, you strived for, for to me, a nice V taper. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think it goes back. I remember, I don't remember how old I was. I was very young. But the first time Steve Reeves made the movie Hercules. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> it, his physique, oh, I, could, I couldn't get over this. Man, that's that's the ideal body. And yeah. I, I guarantee you today, if you had the ability to bring back Steve Reeves compared to the current Mr. Olympia, People could still pick Steve Reese because he had the universal appeal. Yeah. I don't think bodybuilding really started to go overboard. I think it happened with Dorian. Yeah. Dorian yeah. was the first really big guy. And then after that, there was just a progression. Isn't that really when the insulin growth hormone started coming into the sport? And I exactly. think that's the problem. Yeah. 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 So when you guys were young, even though you wanted to get bigger and you were, you know, you were younger bodybuilders and wanted to build up your body, you still always had in mind the ideal physique. It wasn't just about putting on mass. No, in, in my generation, the, I always, the one to me that always stood out was Sergio Oliva. Yeah. Because he had the huge shoulders. And the, I mean, I'm going back to 1966. Mm-hmm. Well, he won the junior Mr. America. And I know this for a fact because I was there. Okay. He only weighed about 197, 198 pounds. But his waist was only 27 inches. Each of his thighs were 28 inches. Each thigh was bigger than his waist. <laughs> and, and, and what confused me was I happened to go across at a Howard Johnson's, and I was really nervous. This is my first <laughs> national contest. And and he's sitting there eating a, a plate of fried chicken and mashed potatoes about 30 minutes before the pre-judging night. I remember telling Rin, I said, what the hell am I doing wrong? I've been dying. Look at the, look at the food this guy is eating. And he, he was, was just, a true genetic freak. Yeah. Oh, he was. Well, he was the first true genetic freak. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And, and then to, to the, the greatest physique photo, in my opinion, that was ever taken was at the 19... 19- 72. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Olympia. Right, he that, exactly. Yeah. He yeah. should have won that contest without a doubt. Yeah. That was, to me, that was the pinnacle of his physique. Yeah. And I think even he realized, you know, Arnold is, that's the way it is. Arnold's always going to be first. Yeah. And, yeah. and that was a shame. That, that was, that, that was because, I mean, he looked unbelievable. Yeah. Boyer, when you first saw Liba win the 66 Olympia and then 67, 68, did you think anybody would ever beat him? No. <laughs> I didn't either. I go, who could beat this guy? Yeah. yeah. And, and you he were was so far the, ahead of everybody else. And, and, and the, the thing about Oliva, which, which really held him back, sadly, he had no education. You know, had he had been educated or had somebody – a good manager looking after him, he could have done a whole lot better than he did with Weeder. I, I think he realized later on that everybody was taking advantage of him. Yeah. I, I actually, I, I don't think he could really, I don't know if this really is true or not, but I've heard this before. He couldn't really read English. Like he would go into a restaurant and, and, our, our, and people would tell me, okay, everybody else is ordering a steak. He might come out with macaroni and cheese. He said, well, why would he eat that? Because he just figured, point to something, whatever they brought him, mm. that's what he would eat. Oh, now, I don't uh, know if that's true or not, but it, it sounds possible. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading about some of those earlier Mr. America contests. I mean, Harold Poole took second a couple of times, and they said the reason was because he had a stuttering problem. And when they did that interview part of it, they said, you know, I think what they were saying was we can't have a guy who's Mr. America go around representing our, our contest if he can't talk, you know. And I think with Sergio, it was because the accent, and like you said, he couldn't speak English that well, and uh, they were always passing him by for someone else to win the contest. I think it was like the Miss America, this all-American yes. yeah. kind of thing. 
That's kind of how they so set you had it to have up. An that interview was, and prove you can talk and, yeah. and show, have some athletic points, right, Boyer? Exactly. Oh, yeah. You had the, the only time I ever competed in a weightlifting contest, you had to have a certain amount of athletic points. Mm -hmm. So if you competed and, and you you scored a certain amount in your weight class, you got the points. So I competed in one contest to do that just to get it out of the way. But you mentioned Harold Poole. Harold Poole was incredible. He first entered, uh, if I remember correctly, the first entered the Mr. America contest when he was 16. 16, yeah. And he still placed, he still placed within, I would say, the top 10 anyway. Yeah. I, I never really got to know him because he, he uh, I competed a few times, but that, that was, for, uh, he was past his prime. And mm -hmm. he, he was very, very quiet. He never really engaged in mm -hmm. much conversation with anybody. He competed in a couple of Dan Lurie contests, as I recall. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was fourth when he was 17. <laughs> and yeah. then second when he was 18 and 19. I mean, it's amazing. He was so good at such a young age. You, you know, know, another thing that I liked about Bill Pearl, I didn't mean to interrupt you, John. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. One of the things I really liked about Bill Pearl was he wasn't entering bodybuilding contests just to win a trophy and then drop, you know, quit training. He was a bodybuilder for life. Yeah. And I remember we had one conversation and he was so disappointed in Grimmick, who was one of his major heroes, because he quit training before he died, right? Mm. And and Bill told me, I'm going to keep training until I drop, you know? <laughs> he, he said, I'm not going to be like that and quit. Yeah. And I mean, even one of the last conversations I had with him, he was telling me how he was fighting, uh, uh, Parkinson's and he told me what his training routine was. Do you want to hear it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He said, uh, Richard, I'm fighting Parkinson's by training three days a week, doing 45 sets, 12 to 20 reps, whole body in an hour and a half. I'm walking for additional. Sets. Huh? 45 sets. Yeah. Wow. And he said, I, I try to keep a positive attitude and think good thoughts and say prayers every night. I could not make it without my wife. She takes over where I leave off. So he, he was bound to determined. He was going to get on the gym no matter what. <laughs> that's amazing yeah I, I thought he had to stop training when he got parkinson's but i'm glad he was able no, to no, do that. no he he continued to train of course until yeah. he had his accident i yeah. spoke to judy actually judy called me the day after bill okay. had passed away and, okay. and and she she he's right he couldn't have done all that without her she was she was his rock she really he really depended on her she yeah. deserves a lot a lot of credit yeah why do you think Bill only competed in the Mr. Universe every couple of years? He wasn't one of those guys, you know, like a lot of the guys are where they go year after year after year. He would he would take like six years off or five years off. Well, I don't think he had anything to prove. OK. You know, he 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 was confident in what he did. And then I, I, the only re the, there's a whole backstory to the 1971 Naba Universe. Okay. He had no interest in competing in that. The backstory on that involved Arthur Jones. For some reason, Arthur believed that Bill and Red and I conspired against Arthur that when he came out with Nautilus, we were going to start our own equipment company, hmm. which we had no, it never entered my mind, okay? What happened, he was so paranoid, he invited Red and I down to, to uh, Lake Helen, Florida. And the little motel room we were staying in, he had Kim Wood spend all night while we were out with Arthur, drilling a hole oh in the wall God. and hiding a microphone so he could listen to what we were saying. And I noticed for a fact, because years later, Arthur told me that. And I said, well, what did you find? So I didn't come up with anything. I said, well, why do you think we would do that? But anyway, somehow or other, <laughs> we got the very first plate-loaded Nautilus bicep and tricep machines. He sent one to Bill, and he sent one to us in Louisiana. Okay. Well, it was it was dangerous. Some guy let the, the thing go, and it mashed the guy's foot. So Bill says, I can't have that, my Jim. So he got Bob Clark, who was a very good equipment builder down in San Diego, to put a selectorized weight stack on it. 
And Arthur blew up when he found out about because he changed Arthur's machine. Mm. So then, then he he got the idea. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy Bill. Well, he, he's going to enter the Nambo universe. He didn't he didn't even want to go to the universe, but he started sending letters, constant letters to Bill and to Leo Stern. Okay, well that pissed Leo off. Okay? Right. So that got Bill motivated because then he went out and hired Sergio, which. They can say, oh, Sergio did that. I don't, I don't think Sergio looked worth a damn when he went to the contest. He was big, but that was it. Smooth. He wasn't yeah. a finished physique. Yeah. And, and that's why Bill won so easily, because he was a polished physique. Mm-hmm. Now, the next year, when Sergio went back to train in his regular way, that's when he he blossomed. He, it was Like I said, it was the best shape he was ever in was when he went to Munich, Germany. Mm. Yeah, so Sergio was training under Arthur Jones, right, for that year in 1971. He did. He did train. Yeah. For, he trained down there in Lake Helen. I want to say, I don't think it was more than about two or three months, if that long. Oh, really? Okay. But, I mean, Arthur was paying him for it, you know. Yeah. And then I think think if he, if he would have won, then Arthur would have given him another 10 grand or something like that. That mm-hmm. was a lot of money back then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I always heard about the uh, article in Iron Man. Was that true that Bill kind of challenged everybody to go to the uh, – he said he was going to go in his last contest was going to be the 71 universe, and if anybody wanted to come up against him, that well, was I, I read that. I read that, too. I don't know if Bill actually wrote that. Okay. And, and it, well, it I wouldn't doubt that Leo out. did, would you? Yeah. But it all started out with Arnold, which he didn't write the article. Uh, Rick Wayne wrote the article. Okay. All the bodybuilders are paper tigers. Because they yeah, won't be afraid to compete. Yeah. Okay, so Arnold ever would go go every year to the Nava Universe. Okay, mm-hmm. you, you could. It was and back in those days, it was open. Okay, you could go whatever organization you wanted to. Okay, as soon as Bill Pearl committed to going, Joe Weider got afraid. So Joe and Ben changed the rules. Arnold couldn't go in the Nava Universe anymore. Mm. That's it. Now, I don't know how it would have turned out if Arnold would have been there. Who mm-hmm. knows? Because yeah. Arnold was basically at his prime in those yeah. days, you know? Yeah. But uh, anyway, that's that's history now. But uh, it, it was it, bodybuilding has always been just, that's what's bad about it, a matter of opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's no, I mean, if you run away, they got somebody who can time you, you cross the finish line first. If it's a split second more, but there's no way bodybuilding. I've, I've always said, I, I don't know how you really judge a contest accurately, because regardless of the judges, they all got their bias. I mean, usually the guy they pick to win is somebody that they would really like to look like. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's just a psychological thing. Right, right, right. Yeah. Bill always chose the Nabba universe and not weeder shows to do right because he felt they were more fair. Yeah. Well, I, I being from my own experience, I, I do think. Look, there was no never any money involved. They they did the hotel was substandard. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, the first time I went over to the hotel, they only had one bathroom on the whole floor. You know, you had to go to the bathroom, <laughs> they go all the way down the hall. You know, <laughs> but the the main thing about the Nava Universe was the prestige of the contest, and a, an Oscar Heinen stand really made you feel. Welcome. He did everything to respect all the bodybuilders. And I think that's what people really admire about the Nava universe. It was a long history. Uh, all the greats won it. Grimmick yep. won it. Steve Reeves won it. Bill Pearl won it. Reg Spark won it. Yeah. So Boy, it was an honor just to be in that group. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did they charge entry fees back then, Boyer, for the competitors? No. 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 It, I, I don't ever remember paying an entry fee to anything. AAU or oh really no kidding IFBB or or uh, what was Dan Lewis contest Coelho well, I don't W-B-B-B. there was no entry fees in those days so. wow no kidding wow so how did Oscar Heidenstam make money then was just from the audience from the audience That's, yeah yeah then he had that uh, uh, health and strength magazine okay and uh, they published that which is I don't I think they still publish that magazine do they really it's, it's yeah. very old yeah 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 that was like one of the first ones I think right. It was, yeah. Yeah, one of the articles I read, Oscar was saying, he said, we don't make any money at this. He said he was losing money 
you know, at that Napa unit. And they had always had like 14 or 16 judges. It was a lot of judges. And from all was a lot of, I, I don't remember how many, but I know it was a lot of judges. Yeah. And the funny thing about now, maybe it changed over the years, but the first first couple of years I went over there, it was it was judged it was judged under natural lighting. It wasn't even in on a stage. It was just you had like a short rise above the floor, and the audience, the judges the judges were there, and the audience was, but the audience was probably less than ten feet away. You actually kind of had to go through the audience to get up on stage. Hmm. Wow. And it was just under natural lighting, you know. But yeah. it, 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 though I remember the first time I was fortunate enough to win. I mean, I mean, I that was the one contest that said, "Wow, I I really did something," you know. Yeah. And it was also the first time I beat Jim Hazel too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Boyer, you were one of the few to win the America and the Universe in the same year. Not many. I think there's only been like five or six guys that have done that in the whole history. Well, see, the, the, I think what happened, and I'm talking too much. We need to get Richard in this thing. Too. <laughs> no, <But> I'm fine. <laughs> the, the, the thing is this. Okay? Dennis was in incredible shape, but he went over there. And I would I would have picked Dennis winning in 67 over Arnold. But mm -hmm. at that time, Arnold had no calves. He wasn't complete. But he was a little bit bigger. And yeah. then he was big in Europe. Now, the next year, Dennis came back. And beat uh, Jim hey, Hayslip. Yeah, and I, I thought it would have J Jim. So then Jim comes back the next year uh, in '69. And I'm thinking, oh man, we're gonna go go at it again. So yeah. the only thing I ever told you, and I love Jim. He was a great guy. I said, Jim, today, and this was back in a little dressing room. I said, today I'm going to beat you. <laughs> and I, I really well, didn't Arnold know, but I was hoping. Right. <laughs> and and I think that psyched him out, you know. But it was it was a it was a close contest because Jim had that beautiful physique, you know, had that yeah, all American, I guess it'd say Southern California or Florida physique. Yeah. He was very popular. Yeah, he had a nice broad shoulders and a and a nice waist. He kind of even reminded me of Steve Reeves. He did. Yeah, he was the closest thing to Steve Reeves. Yeah. Yeah, even uh, Bill said uh, regarding the judging with the Navi Universe, he said even Arnold used to really uh, enjoy those victories because he said he knew it was fair, you know, because you had all oh, these yeah. from all around. It wasn't like a weeder contest where it might have been set up, you know. It was it was a really honest victory. So even Arnold was uh, he was happy with those Navi Universe victories. Oh well, yeah, well I, I don't even know. I haven't been to uh, IFBB contest in many years i have no idea how it's judged but i mean for years and i and i'll, I'll give wayne demilia credit he was the one that truly developed the professional divisions mm -hmm. and before him there was really not much of us. he's the one that started the grand prix shows yeah and you're I, I i was never clear to me why they booted him out i, I never understood that no one's ever told me exactly what happened but now I, I think it's it's just basically a money money making deal. I, I don't even know who judges uh, the the Mister Olympia anymore. Yeah. Or I, you know, for years when Ben Weeder was alive, they always had they made a big deal of uh, IFBB Mister Universe, and they'd always have the IFBB Congress, and you always got a big report of that in the magazines. Yeah. Of course, the magazines no longer exist. I don't even think they have that anymore. No, they don't. I don't think so. No. Hey, Richard, were you in that 78 America, the one that was in Cincinnati? Yes. Yeah. And Bill, Bill guest posed at that, right? Because that yeah. was his 25th anniversary. Yeah. When I saw him pose, I said, you should have entered the contest. You would have won right, it. Right. <laughs> yeah. The reason I mentioned it, I, I saw Roger Schwab on Facebook, and he wrote a really nice tribute to Bill. And he said he was at that show. He was at that 78 America. And he was blown away by Bill when he guest posed. Yeah. Bill could have won that contest at, yeah. I think he was 48 years old at that time. Yeah, absolutely. I was shocked. He looked so good. I go, like, man, he's not even trained for a contest. And he shows up looking like this, making <laughs> yeah. us all look bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you guys I've ever never see Boyer come uh, guest pose in, out of shape either? Yeah. Did you guys ever see Bill do his strongman act where he would like tear the license plate in half and bend the, the nails and stuff? I haven't. I, th no. I, I think 
I think I'm trying to remember. I think he did some of that at the show down in Winter Haven, Florida. This was back in 1968. Okay. I, I, I vaguely remember that, but I think he, he tore a deck of cards and he tore a license plate. That's all I remember. I don't remember what else he did as far as a strong man. It seems like I recall that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy back then. Like Chuck Sipes used to do that too. And a couple of those bodybuilders would do that. Like, and even Franco would come out and like deadlift on the night he was competing, you know, he'd be deadlifting like 700 pounds. That was crazy. I, I can't imagine any of these bodybuilders today doing anything stressful, you know, before a competition, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, you only got to look back at poor Ronnie Coleman. Yeah. God. I mean, here's a guy, eight-time Mr. Olympia, and arguably the guy who had the most muscle of anybody at the anybody, time. Anybody, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many. I don't, I don't even know. I don't. I haven't kept up with him in a long time. I don't think he, I think he's just in a wheelchair now. Yeah. I, I, that's a shame. It is. Yeah, right. I saw him at, at 11, the Arnold. 11 back surgeries? I think he had like 14. God. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. My God. I saw him at the Arnold. He was wheeled into it in, in there. And then they, this girl helped him with crutches to get to his seat so he could sign yeah. autographs. Yeah. 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 I said. Yeah. Yeah, he pushed it hard for a long time. I mean, he was so strong, you know, and he was he was using weights that no one else was, you know. Oh, I know, I know. Well, I, I was reading uh, some of these articles about Bill, and uh, I read one where he was doing a strongman act. That's why I was asking you guys if you ever saw it. And he had one where he had like a spike, like a railroad spike, and he was bending it. And I think he was on tour or something because he was gone for like over a week. And he was getting tired because he was in hotel rooms and stuff, you know. And so one of the last ones he did, he tried to bend the spike and it wouldn't bend. So he kept trying harder and harder. And the spike ended up going through his right hand. <laughs> and he showed it to the audience and the place went crazy, he gave like a standing ovation. And then I guess he had to walk through the audience to go to the dressing room and the place was going nuts. And he's like, I should do this every time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Why do you think Bill's physique was so revered? I mean, was it the size or was it just like, like you said, Richard, that symmetry and the proportion too? I think it was both as a combination of everything. Yeah. And that presentation on top of it. Yeah. 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 I, I agree with that completely, but a lot had to do with his presence. People really genuinely liked Bill Pearl. Yeah. That's, that's what made him stand out. You know, so many of these bodybuilders, got such big egos, you know, that takes away from their physique. Bill was humble. He was never like that. Yeah. That's, to me, what made him great. Yeah. And, Boyer, you said he had an older brother, right, who was bigger than him. Oh, Harold. Actually, right after Bill passed away, I got to thinking about Harold. And I, I tried to track him down, and I did find out. Red told me. Well, the last time he visited Bill, he had asked about Harold, and Harold had just passed away, too. He was also 91. He was two years older than Bill. But okay. the, the, the thing about Harold, Harold had the genetics that Bill had. Had he been serious about bodybuilding, he would have been just as good or even better than Bill. <laughs> we talk about a guy who had a huge frame. And I saw this myself okay he could take his ring finger and pass a quarter through it that's how thick his fingers were okay and, and, and he where bill was an extremely nice humble guy harold was mean mm. you know i i was in bill pearl's gym in los angeles the one on manchester boulevard and a guy came in there i i just I came from the airport, went to Bill's gym. I was waiting for Bill to get back. So I'm sitting there talking to Harold. First time I met Harold. So a guy comes in raising hell because he had bought some desiccated liver tablets and had given him diarrhea. Mm. And he was raising hell. He wanted his money back. Real cursing loud and a pretty big guy. So we're sitting there. And I said, well, how many did you take? He said, I was supposed to take 40 a day. I said, well, how many did you take at one time? I took all 40 at one time. I said, well, there's your problem. Man. And, and about that time, Harold, Harold had had enough. So he reaches down, he just pulls out like a baseball bat. 
<laughs> he don't say nothing to the guy. He's going to wail on him. And the guy starts running. And Harold chases him out of the gym <laughs> over about, oh, I don't know, maybe 25 yards. The guy kept running. I mean, that's how quick a temper he had. Well, Bill yeah. always told me that's why he started bodybuilding because Harold, when they were kids, Harold would beat him up all the time. That's what I heard too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it's interesting too how Bill got much bigger. I mean, I always thought that he had those genetics where he was born <laughs> like that. But when you see pictures of him when he started, he was actually pretty skinny. But he oh, just yeah. must have had the kind of genetics where he responded. And he also always did uh, like really heavy weight training, right? He did like the basic compound movements and and he was pretty strong, right, Bill, at his peak? Oh, he was. He was, yeah. Yeah. I never had an opportunity to to watch him work out. I regret I didn't do that. But uh, I never had an opportunity to watch him train. Mm -hmm. Did he do something like was... over a 300 pound behind the neck press or something? That's what I read, yeah. Yeah. Put it in, yeah. I wouldn't doubt it. He was strong. <laughs> yeah. And for back then, I mean, that was really strong for back in the 50s and 60s, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then he trained a lot of people. Like, I mean, you know, we know he trained Chris Dickerson, but I think he was helping out. He didn't he help out Dennis Tenorino. Uh, oh yeah, that, that was that was way before Chris. I mean, yeah, Dennis yeah. would come out from New York right to California every summer and train with Bill, <clears throat> and then he trained uh, Jim Morris. Yep, and, uh, and and several other people. Yeah, he Dave Johns trained right? a lot of guys. Clint yeah. Burrell. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I, when I interviewed Chris years ago, uh, before he passed away, he said that it was just kind of fortunate that once he started bodybuilding, once he decided to start weight training, Bill just opened up that gym in Los Angeles, and it was only like a couple blocks away from his house. So it was just like it was the closest gym to him, and let, little did he know mm -hmm. that he was going to have Bill Pearl as his <laughs> trainer, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was a good gym. I never had an opportunity to train here, but I went there several times, but... Uh... I think it was on well, it was on Manchester Boulevard in England, yeah. which is very near the airport. Yeah. So did Bill help you out, Boyer, when you were competing, like when you were going for the Mr. America universe? I mean, did he help well, you? I, I, I would talk to I would talk to him a lot. Okay. You know, I mean, we didn't really he would ask me how I was doing and stuff like that. And Red was the one that Red was a stickler, just like Bill with posing. I spent more time uh backstage or in the gym, he had an old room back there, and I would, I'd spend hours pulling. He'd get on me. The funny thing about him, he said, "Don't bother doing a chest pulls. You just can't do it. Forget about it." <laughs> you know, but a it was a compulsory pose. Like and you had to do it. And and in '68, I ended up winning best chest. Right. I told him, "See, I know what I'm doing after all." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you, Richard? Did you ever get a chance to, uh, like, how well did you know Bill throughout the years? I mean, you met him back in the... Not well, I, you know, I, uh, I I told you I met him in 71, and then yeah. at the AD of uh, Mr. Universe, he came up to me and said, uh, how do you think you're going to do? I said, I think the guy I beat last year is going to beat me this year. I th you know, I think I'm going to come in second. He said, holy, he didn't say holy moly, what did he say? Something to the effect that, you know, you're the first bodybuilder I ever talk to that had a, a a realistic picture of himself everybody <laughs> said oh i'm gonna win you know right i said right. Well, you know I, I try to be objective you know yeah and then uh, uh, later years later i was i was writing for bodybuilding.com mm -hmm. and i was gonna do an article on bill and so he gave me his phone number and i was gonna do it and then i got really busy at work and everything and stuff just went crazy and then i and i just never did it and so i really and then we got in touch again years later and just infrequently, you know, how you doing, what's up, all that kind of stuff. I, I was really freaking out about how the, the posts I was getting from him or the messages like after the accident. Yeah. And the last one I got, I, I was asking him, well, how's it going, you know, uh, with that brace, that clamshell and all that stuff, you know, because they had a broken back plus the neck, right? And then he got a bacterial infection and stuff. But the last yeah. thing I got from Rich Every day a little better. Many thanks, Bill. That short mm -hmm. little thing. But, you know, yeah. so that gave me hope. That maybe we'll be able to go see. Because I was going to go see him before the accident happened. Mm -hmm. So then that got can canceled again. And then, boom, he's gone. And mm -hmm. I I'm going, oh, my God. First gimmick. And then I'll, Scott and all these other guys are now Pearl. Yeah. My world's disappearing. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you know, it's funny. 
because as long as I've known Bill, you just don't see this guy. You think he's going to be around forever. Yeah. You know, I, I remember right after I, I heard, I called Red, and Red says, oh, my God. Yeah, he says, he says, you know, he says, it's like God died, you know? <laughs> yeah. He says, we yeah. all thought he was going to, and Red's not a youngster either. He's 86. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm so glad that that Red had an opportunity to go visit him before he passed away. Mm-hmm. And uh, but he said Bill's mind was still as sharp as ever. Really? And I think in talking to Judy about five days before, I think he just told her he didn't want to be a burden on her anymore. He'd had enough. So even he chose the time he was mm-hmm. checking out. Yeah. Because, like Richard said, he got that infection and he couldn't get rid of it. And I think. According to Judy, that's what finally did him in. Oh, but really? About five days before he died, he just quit eating. And then he went into hospice, and that was it. Mm. Guys, I hate to cut this short, but I, I got a meeting I got to get to. Okay. Uh, I hate to leave you guys, but I really no. enjoyed and, and enjoyed uh, visiting with Richard. I hadn't had a chance yeah. to talk to him in many years. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can wrap it up there. If you guys got any final thoughts on Bill, I, I appreciate you guys. Because I know both of you have known him for so long, especially you, Boyer. And you were in touch with him on the phone for so many decades. That's why I really wanted to have both of you guys on to, uh, you know, to give a final tribute to Bill. Or it'll never be well, the same, right, Boyer? No, I, I agree. In other words, he he's, go- I mean, he has left a huge imprint on my life. I mean, I admired Bill Pearl so much. Even when I was a kid, and I'm sure Richard's aware of this because oh, yeah. he's very okay. He had a, a he had a dove tattooed on his shoulder. Yeah, I remember. At 13, I said, "Man, I want to get a tattoo like that." <laughs> so I go down to this little little tattoo shop. I'd say I think it was like 17 or 18 dollars to get that. I picked it out. So here I am riding my bike down there to get that tattoo. Man, I got my money. I'm walking in the shop, and a guy says, hey, where are you going? It was my dad. Oh. My bro- my friend had told on me, and he went down there. I, I, well, I was caught. I said, well, I think I'm going to get a tattoo. He said, come here, son. He said, I'll give you a tattoo. And <laughs> with my butt, and that, I, that was the end of my design to ever, ever have a tattoo. Oh, man, that's a great story. <laughs> Yeah, he, he was really a, a special person. I, I only oh, got to meet Bill a few times, but uh, yeah. he was just an amazing man. And uh, I think we're all going to miss him. You know, he was one of the oh, one of the greats in the whole sport, for sure. Well, guys, I'm going to sign off now. Okay. Really enjoyed. Thank you for having me on, John. Thanks, Richard, Boyer. Thanks again. Seeing you again. Yes, you too, Boyer. It's been too long. Yeah. <laughs> okay. God bless you guys. Thanks, Boyer. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, well, thanks for having me. I mean, uh, thanks it was for great. Here. Just to, you know, talk with you again, but also Boyer, because I hadn't yeah. seen him or talked to him in a long time. So yeah, that was great. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And Thank thanks you. for all you're doing for the sport. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate it, buddy. I mean, that this is important stuff that you've done yeah. to preserve the memories of all this of our sport. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. All right. Okay. All right, Richard. Yeah, have a good talk one. Talk to you soon, buddy. Okay. All right. All right.